with humility. For God resists the proud. God what? God don't like proud people. But give grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. He may exalt you in due time. Friends, church, listen to the next sentence that I'm about to say. Okay, it's time to wake up. It is a dangerous thing, dangerous thing, to push God to the point that He pushes back. Say it again. It is a dangerous, very dangerous, to push God to the limit in trying to get your attention that the only way He can get your attention is by pushing back. You don't want God to push back. That's why the Bible says, humble yourself. Yourself. You do it yourself. You don't want God to humble you. Because if God humbles you, you will never forget it and you'll never be the same. Because when God pushes back and God humbles you, friends, God does not play. God does not play. We're going to look at the story of a man who pushed God and pushed God and God pushed back. Father in heaven, Lord, as we prepare to dive into your word, I ask that you hope that your Holy Spirit enter our hearts and in our minds. And if you take away any distraction, we may be focused on your word through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And we're talking about preparation for the last days. We've been looking at that. And for that reason, there is Daniel chapter 12, we're in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, in preparation for these last days, the Bible tells us how ugly it's going to get. So ugly that Daniel can't even describe it. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, at that time, Michael shall stand up, right before he comes. We're going we're gonna to study in a future sermon what is at that time. At that time, Michael shall stand up a great prince who stand watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was seen since there was a nation. A time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that time. The world is going to get worse, friends, than what happened in 2011 in New York. Worse things than that are going to happen. Worse things than the tsunami that, that affected Thailand. And if you remember the, the news and watching it, I mean, you could not shed a tear and just feel for the people and seeing the graphics. The video of people who are at home which just destroyed in a matter of seconds. The world is going to get worse than that. Even worse than what ISIS is doing. Not beginning that can get worse. If you really follow what they are doing, you really have no heart. Conscience is gone from them. Yet the Bible tells us, and there shall be time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Since there was a nation. If you look in 2 Timothy chapter 3, we, we've seen these descriptions. It's not only going to get bad out there in the world, but even in the church, there in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verses 1 through 5, we've read these characteristics of how the world is going to be in the last days. As I mentioned in the last days, in the last days, I'm talking about right before Jesus comes. The last days of first history. But know this, that in the last days, earliest times will come. For men will be loving themselves, over money, both 
shoulders proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slander, without self-control, brutal, despiders of good, traitors, <coughs> headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And, and, and notice verse 5, having a form of what? Godliness, but denying its power. But denying its power. There will be wicked people outside of the church and wicked people inside of the church. <coughs> That's why they're going back to Daniel. Chapter 12. After God revealed to Daniel this book and everything that's going to happen in these last days, God tells their Daniel in verse in chapter 12, verse 4, to shut the book up until the time of the end. So Daniel is a, is a book for us. It's a book for our time. It's a, it's a time for us to open the book of Daniel. Open the book. If you claim to follow Christ and we don't pay attention to His Word, to His Word, surrender fully to His will, God will get your attention one way or another. You see, the devil knows, the devil knows how bad we can really become. The devil knows our secrets, even secrets that we might hide with our spouses or our children. The devil knows exactly how bad we can be. And it's foolish to think. It's foolish to think, well, I know I do such and such, but I would never do such and such. To think that, well, I know that I, I should be doing this, but I would never go so far as to with that brother or that sister. That's just being naive. Because once you let Satan in your life, at least a little part, you can't put a limit on it. You cannot put a limit. You can't put a limit on sin once you are experimenting even with a little bit. Some of you know that you may be doing the wrong thing, but you go ahead and do it. But in your mind, you're thinking, but I wouldn't go so far as to do this. Think of a time that you've done something wrong and you went ahead and did it. Think. Okay? Think of a time. Go back in time. Maybe it was a year ago, five years ago, maybe it was yesterday. Think of a time that you did something wrong, that you knew was wrong, and you went ahead and did it. Did you do it? How many did it? Turn to Jeremiah 17. You know why you did it? Jer Jeremiah tells us. Jeremiah 17. We looked at this last Sabbath. Jeremiah 17. You know, why did we do it? We know it was wrong, but we still did it. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. We still did it because we're thinking and that, well, I know I'm not as bad as such and such person. <clears throat> the heart is deceitful above all things. And desperately wicked, who can ever trust it or know it? You did it because you trusted in your own heart. You trusted in your mind. You trusted in, in your, well, I think it's okay this time. Ecclesiastes. Verse 9, well, why is this man? And sometimes I wonder because he was a wisest man, but sometimes the dumbest man. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, Solomon writes, verse 3, This is an evil in all that is done under the, the sun. That one thing happens to all. All of us are guilty of this. Of what? Truly the heart of the sons of the men are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live. So how, so can we trust?
trust for our hearts, yeah. our mind. Here, Solomon tells us it's full of evil, of madness. Of madness. Proverbs 14, verse 12, we've seen this already. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is a way of death. There's a way that seems right to you, but its end is destruction. It's death. There is something going on here in Daniel. And God is in the process of converting a heathen into a believer. A heathen into a believer. Going back to Daniel. Daniel chapter 4. And you can trace how God is working on Nebuchadnezzar. You can trace it step by step by step. Being drawn to God, friends, is one thing, but being changed by God is a whole different thing. Everybody is being drawn to God. Even the atheists who claim that there is no God are in one way or another being drawn to God. You today were drawn to God. You're here. But it's another thing to be changed by God. To be changed by God. <coughs> How often does God have to tap us, maybe on the shoulders, to get our attention? Have you ever done something over and over and over, and it's the same thing that someone says, you know, where are you going to get it? Stop doing this, or going there, or... Maybe, maybe you... You, you know, you get a, a ticket in the same spot quite frequently. If you're, if you're in, ever driving to the Burleson area where HEV is, <laughs> you can't even pass the little line a little bit because your picture is taken right there and congratulations, you get a ticket in a minute. So, and sometimes we get the same one over and over and over. How often does God have to tap us to get our attention? Step by step, Nebuchadnezzar is being drawn to God. We see there in Daniel chapter 1 that God moves him from total ignorance of a God to awareness of a God. You remember the story there where the Hebrews did not want to eat the king's food and they were given time prove themselves, and they, they, did they come out on top? Yes. They sure did. And King Nebuchadnezzar couldn't, couldn't rationalize on how these men, who eating what they wanted to eat, a vegetarian diet, were smarter than his men, who ate everything else under the sun, and under the sea. And at one point in your life, you have to come to the awareness that you need God. God was letting Nebuchadnezzar, giving him awareness. I am alive. I am here. And that was Nebuchadnezzar's first step. That was Nebuchadnezzar's first step. Now, has the knowledge of the awareness of God changed your life? Did it change Nebuchadnezzar's life? No. He was aware, he was, he was becoming aware, there must be a God, because these, the these who believe in a different God somehow came out on top. There must be some kind of God. But having the knowledge or awareness of God, does it change your life? Does it change your life? Do you live as a person aware of the presence of God? Does it affect the way, does, does it affect you when you're about to do something? You see, if, if you are always aware that God is right there watching and always with you, you would think twice when you're about to do something wrong. Because you're aware of God right here. God is writing this down. Are we aware of the presence of God? And friends, irreverence, irreverence, in a church sanctuary, is evidence that the person does not, is not aware of the presence of God. But I thank God, I thank God, in this church that's not an issue. I've been to churches, friends, where, and there have been some of my dear churches that I love, but there, I can't even constantly.
becoming trait, but so much irreverent. And here, Nebuchadnezzar even recognizes that there is a God there in Daniel 1, 19 and 20. He says, Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. And in all the matters of wisdom and understanding, above which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. He recognized. In Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar was taught about control. Control is the key of being a Christian, friends. Did you study your Sabbath school lesson this week? Control. We need to recognize that we are not in, in control. We are not in control. Nebuchadnezzar is not in control. And God was telling him, yes, you will be king, but then somebody else, and then somebody else, and then another nation. And Nebuchadnezzar thought that he was in control. He thought he was in control by commanding all the wise men to be killed, but yet even God intervened there. We are not in control, friends. We need to remember that. We need to remember that. Sometimes we think that we are in control. We can't even get up in the morning without God. You can't go to work without God. You can't find a job without God. You can't even get well if you're sick without God. You can't breathe without God. You can't even find a spouse without God, friends. Some of us have tried and paying for it. You cannot do anything without God. God is in control. And friends, as the time is passing, and we will have constituency meetings here for the Texas Conference soon, and then the General Conference is coming in July, some may think that they're in control with their little agenda. But God is still in control. God is still in control. Don't let those little things get in your way of your faith. There, the second tap to Nebuchadnezzar reminds him that he is not in control. There in Daniel 2, 48 and 49, he, Nebuchadnezzar, it says, Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Also Daniel petitioned the king and said, and he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gates of the king. And the Knesset recognized that God was in Daniel. And that there is a God. Even even though he put him in charge and he was teaching, he was teaching Nebuchadnezzar that God is God is in control. Nebuchadnezzar still thought he was in control in Daniel chapter 3. Re remember what he did. He made the image all of gold. Not of gold and a silver, bronze, brass, no. All of gold. And the Lord was getting a little impatient with him now. You see that he's not getting the point. And he needs to get Nebuchadnezzar's attention. And he actually does get his attention when he shows up right in the fiery furnace. <coughs> he got Nebuchadnezzar's attention when he saw a fourth man walking with the other three. And what did he say? It looks even like the Son of Man. God is starting to get impatient with Nebuchadnezzar. But you see, even when God protected his faithful ones, Nebuchadnezzar recognized that and confessed about the true God. There in Daniel chapter 3, verse 28. It says, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Babylon, no, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants. Blessed be 
be that God. And then later on, even in verses 29 and onward, it says if anyone speaks against that God, they're going to be cut into pieces. He recognized your God is the true God. But confession of truth is still not living truth. Confession of truth is still not living truth. It's just confession. You're just confessing that something is true. This is why there's a danger in church services. Because in church services, things are said, and our response is what? Amen. 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 There it is. You're, it's, a, it's a confession of truth. A pastor may say something. Amen. Mm-hmm. That's right. Preach it. But then comes Sunday and Monday. And what you said amen to, then throughout the week you forget to live what you said amen to. What was this week's Sabbath school about? Fighting? Fighting. Was it a good Sabbath school lesson? Can we say amen? amen. Ah, but then comes the week. <laughs> then comes the week. Confession of truth is one thing, but living the truth is another. We may confess that God is coming soon. Amen. Amen. But then the week comes, and we are given opportunities to share that God is coming soon, and we know. And we know. The third tap to Nebuchadnezzar reminded him that it is a dangerous thing to confess that God is right, but not accept it. And even try to change it. And even try to change it. He gave his own interpretation by making the whole image of the he, he literally tried to change God's word. And he's tapping Nebuchadnezzar, reminding him, that it's not good enough just to confess that he is right. You need to live up to the will of God. So now we get to the meat of the sermon this morning in Daniel chapter 4. In Daniel chapter 4, follow along with me there in verse 1. And you can measure the king to all the people, nations, and languages that dwelt in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked on me. This is, this is a testimony right here. He's saying, I thought it good to declare these signs to you, and thank God that he did. Verse 3, for a great, now how great are the signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. Here, chapter 4, is a testimony of the conversion of Nebuchadnezzar. The only chapter in the Bible that is written by a Hebrew. Of a converted Hebrew. I saw a dream, verse 5, which, was made, which, which made me afraid, and the thought on my bed and the vision of my head troubled me. Therefore, I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians and astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. Of course, they had already struck out before. You see, friends, recognizing confession of truth isn't living truth. Right here, we know that he confessed that Daniel knew the interpretation. <coughs> he should have gone to Daniel right here. That would have been living truth. Verse 8 says, But at last Daniel came before me, as his name is Dr. Shazer, according to the name of my God, and him, the spirit of the holy God. And I told the dream before him, saying, Dr. Shazer, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of, God, of the holy God is in you, and no secret troubles. You explain to me the vision of the dream that I have seen and its interpretation. And he begins the dream. These were the visions on my head while on my bed. I was looking and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. Verse 11. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens and 
it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were, were lovely, its fruit of abundance, and in it was food for how much? All. Oh, the beasts of the fields found shade under it. The birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. Are you picturing the tree in your mind? Big tree. Verse 13, I saw in the vision on my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from where? From heaven. Verse 14, he cried aloud and said thus, chop down the tree. Whoa. Was the tree dying? Was it weak? Was it dry with no leaves and no fruit? No, on the contrary, big, big fruit, even shade. But then somebody, a voice from heaven said what? Chop down the tree and cut it off and cut off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the leaves get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the what? The stump and roots in the earth. Bound it, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let him Notice, notice the change now. Let him, talking about the tree, now it says, let him gaze, let, let, I'm sorry, let, let him graze with the beasts of the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him, let him be given the heart of a beast and let seven times pass over him. This decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the Holy Ones in order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of God. Why would the watchers take to cut the tree? In order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of God. Give it to whoever he will and set over it the lowest of men. This is the dream King Nebuchadnezzar has have seen. Now you declare his interpretation since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation. And Daniel begins to give the interpretation. And he begins by saying that you, King, are the, are that tree. That big tree with all the big fruit and big leaves and basically the blessings of God he gave to Nebuchadnezzar in his kingdom. Demonstrated that his kingdom was the most powerful kingdom in the world. There he said what, where, where the vision said that the tree fed the nations. Do you, you remember many coming to Babylon while there was a famine? So here he gives the interpretation in verse 20. The tree that you saw which grew and became strong, whose height reached the heavens and its cloud could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundance, in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and in those branches the birds of heaven had their homes. It is you, okay. verse 20 who have grown and become strong, for your greatness has grown and, have, and reaches to the heavens and your dominion to the end. And inasmuch as the king saw a watchman, a holy man, coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave it stone and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze, in the tender grass of the fields, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him raised with the beast for how long? Seven times passed over him. Seven years. This is the interpretation of him. And this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord, the King. They shall drive you out from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. And they shall make you eat grass like an ox. They shall wet you with, with the dew of heavens, and seven times shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of 
men, and give it to whoever it can choose. Here, God humbled Nebuchadnezzar by taking out reason from his mind and becoming like a dumb animal. Eating grass, living outside. The description is even, is even, I'm skipping a lot of it, but where there it says that his hair grew long, his fingernails grew like an eagle. He became an animal, basically. He became an animal. After the dream, after the dream, Daniel makes an appeal to King Nebuchadnezzar. He makes the appeal there in verse 27. Notice chapter 4, verse 27. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. What is his appeal? Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercies to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. Maybe, maybe, Knezzer, if you repent, if you recognize that God is giving you these blessings, maybe if you respond to the call of God, if you are humble yourself, now God won't have to humble you later. God won't have to break you later. Just maybe. Return to Him. He's appealing to Him. Notice verse 28. Notice the grace the grace of God. All this came upon Nebuchadnezzar, about King Nebuchadnezzar, verse 29. At the end of how long? Twelve months. Did, did God say, all right, you got to repent right now? He gave how long King Nebuchadnezzar? A year. A whole year to repent. But you see, there's a danger when we put off the time of repentance. The preacher makes an appeal to repent, to render your life to God, and you put it off. And you put it off. Eventually, you forget it. A whole year passed by. A whole year passed by. At the end of 12, of the 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built? for a royal dwelling in my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty. He is giving all the credit to himself. And the dream about the victory that we saw, God blessed him with his kingdom. And then in verse 31, while the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. And the rest of the verses describe on how his reason left him. He went out to wander with the beasts. He went out to live like an animal. But yet Daniel had appealed to him. Had appealed to him. Perhaps if you break off your sins, show mercy, God will extend. Church, I'm appealing to you today. Humble yourself now, right now, today. And maybe God won't have to humble you later. Amen. It's better to bend right now than to be broken later. The time for Nebuchadnezzar to repent, to repent was right then. Now is the time for you to respond and to repent if you have not responded. In verse 34, after, after, after God humbled Nebuchadnezzar, it says, and at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me. How did his reason return to him? By doing what? Yes, exactly. Looking to heaven. Recognizing it's all God. It's 
all about him. He's the one that sets kingdoms, put down kingdoms. He's the one that does everything and allows everything. And then it says there, I look up to heaven and my understanding returned to me and I bless the Most High and praise and honor him who lives forever. Who lives forever. For his domain, for his domission is an everlasting domination and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, just as he was. He does according to his will in the arms of heaven, in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can resist his hand or say to him, What have you done? At that time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. God restored the kingdom back to him. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of Heaven. You see, before, you remember he would, he would say, the King, the King and God of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now it's not their King. It's His God. It's His King. Now God is His personal God. All whose works are truth and His ways justice and who, and those who walk in pride, He is able to put down. Does He ever know that? <coughs> Friends, I want to I want to close by telling you a story. A story of my of my father-in-law. You see, he. He was a, a medical a medical doctor. He became a Seventh-day Adventist as a teenager. And gradually, gradually, he graduated from medical school, became a successful medical doctor. He owned his own practice and clinic. He owned his own pharmacy. But he began to draw away from God. He began to draw away from God. He married out of the faith. To make matters worse, a Seventh-day Adventist married out of the faith and into Catholicism. Out of all the denominations, he took mass and bowed down to the priest. Married out of the faith into Catholicism. He began to open his clinic on Sabbath. He began to open his pharmacy on Sabbath. And along the way, God was tapping him. Along the way. Just like Nebuchadnezzar, God tapped Nebuchadnezzar. I'm here. He tapped Nebuchadnezzar again. I'm in control. He tapped me with the again. You saw me in the fire. Don't change my word. And he tapped my father-in-law. One of those tappings was a shock for him. One of his daughters had fallen with her bike into an oil well. An oil well. And an angel of the Lord brought her up. Amen. That shook him. He's like, whoa, I need, a, I, need a, I need to get my life right with God. And for a little bit he did. But we know human nature. He went back again. And God tapped him again. And his Catholic wife, by the work of the Holy Spirit, and by the work of a powerful, filled pastor, converted to Adventism. with my beloved mother-in-law today and decided to follow God regardless of the family rejection that she encountered. You see, when you are a strong good Catholic and you abandon that, you are looked at a traitor. And for many years, I still think even up to today, they still consider her a traitor. And God tapped him by working in her, her heart that she became a 
shoulder, trying to humble him. But God saw it necessary that the only way he would get his attention was if you pushed him back. And God did. You see, God took everything away. Literally everything. Except his family. Except the wife and his children. He took away his pharmacy. Gone. His clinic. Gone. His reputation as a great doctor there, gone. His car, his house, everything, gone, gone, gone. Literally stripped him. And God humbled him for five years. And in those five years, like Nebuchadnezzar, he eventually had to look up to them and said, Lord, I have sinned against turned his life around. He turned his life around. And like Joshua, he said, that for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And you know what God did? He restored everything back to him. He became a prominent medical doctor again. He restored his pharmacy again. His practice again. His house Heart, God restored everything back to him. But now he was serving God the way God wanted him to serve. From then on, from that day on, he put God first. From that day on, until God laid him to rest, he lived a humble life dedicated to God and his work. But God had to humble him. Friends, in these last days, we need to live humbly before God. Live humbly before God. You don't want to push God and push God if you push him back. Because when he does it, does not affect him. He will humble you in a way that you will never forget. But if that's what it takes to get you into the kingdom, he will do it, friends. Because he wants you there. He wants you there more than you want to be there, actually. God wants every single one of you in his kingdom even more than we desire to be there. Maybe you have a time when you <coughs> want to surrender and it's not right now, but God has his time and his time is right now. Right now. So I'm going to make it easy for you, church. I want to appeal to those that God is calling you, to those that God is calling you to be a member of this church. I'm going to make it easy for you. If you have been hearing the voice of God, you've been coming, some of you have been coming for years or months, and no interest in becoming a full member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. God is tapping you. You already go. You already keep to say, what is keeping you from becoming a man? What is keeping you from fully committing all the way? God is tapping on your shoulder. Friends, I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I want to make it as simple as possible. I'm going to have a prayer right now. You want to be a member of this church, whether by a profession of faith, by baptism, or transfer. At the end, when you walk out after a closing hymn, it's a clipboard where you can please print your name and a contact. And I will get a hold of you this week. I can't make it any easier than that. You don't have to get up, I will make you uncomfortable. But if God is tapping you and tugging at your heart, what are you waiting for? God is waiting for you. I've said already too much. 
yourself before God. And He will lift you up. Humble yourself. Even if you are a member of this church, we still need to live humbly, humble lives. Church, not just here in Clearburn, but all around the world.